To thine own self be true, says Shakespeare's Polonius, and thou canst be false to no man. Live in truth, urged Václav Havel. Let the lie come into the world, wrote Solzhenitsyn, but not through me. How seriously should we take these pronouncements, and how do we obey them? There are two kinds of untruth, lying and faking. The person who is lying says what he or she does not believe. The person who is faking says what he believes, though only for the time being and for the purpose in hand. Anyone can lie. It suffices to say something with the intention to deceive. Faking, however, is an achievement. To fake things, you have to take people in, yourself included. The liar can pretend to be shocked when his lies are exposed, but his pretense is part of the lie. The fake really is shocked when he is exposed, since he had created around himself a community of trust, of which he himself was a member. In all ages, people have lied in order to escape the consequences of their actions, and the first step in moral education is to teach children not to tell fibs. But faking is a cultural phenomenon, more prominent in some periods than in others. There is very little faking in the society described by Homer, for example, or in that described by Chaucer. By the time of Shakespeare, however, poets and playwrights are beginning to take a strong interest in this new human type. In Shakespeare's King Lear, the wicked sisters Goneril and Regan belong to a world of fake emotion, persuading themselves and their father that they feel the deepest love when in fact they are entirely heartless. But they don't really know themselves to be heartless. If they did, they could not behave so brazenly. The tragedy of King Lear begins when the real people, Kent, Cordelia, Edgar, Gloucester, are driven out by the fakes. The fake is a person who has rebuilt himself with a view to occupying another social position than the one that would be natural to him. Such is Molière's Tartuffe, the religious impostor who takes control of a household through a display of scheming piety. Like Shakespeare, Molière perceived that faking goes to the very heart of the person engaged in it. Tartuffe is not simply a hypocrite who pretends to ideals that he does not believe in. He is a fabricated person who believes in his own ideals since he is just as illusory as they are. Tartuffe's faking was a matter of sanctimonious religion. With the decline of religion during the 19th century, there came about a new kind of faking. The romantic poets and painters turned their backs on religion and sought salvation through art. They believed in the genius of the artist, endowed with a special capacity to transcend the human condition in creative ways, breaking all the rules in order to achieve a new order of experience. Art became an avenue to the transcendental, the gateway to a higher kind of knowledge. Originality, therefore, became the test that distinguishes true art from fake. It is hard to say in general terms what originality consists in, but we have examples enough. Titian, Beethoven, Goethe, Baudelaire. But those examples teach us that originality is hard. It can't be snatched from the air, even if there are those natural prodigies like Rambo and Mozart who seem to do just that. Originality requires learning, hard work, the mastery of a medium, and, most of all, the refined sensibility and openness to experience that have suffering and solitude as their normal cost. To gain the status of an original artist is therefore not easy. But in a society where art is revered as the highest cultural achievement, the rewards are enormous. Hence there is a motive to fake it. Artists and critics get together in order to take themselves in, the artists posing as the originators of astonishing breakthroughs, the critics posing as the penetrating judges of the true avant-garde. In this way, Duchamp's famous urinal became a kind of paradigm for modern artists. This is how it is done, the critics said. Take an idea, put it on display, call it art, and brazen it out. The trick was repeated with Andy Warhol's Brillo boxes, and then later with the pickled sharks and cows of Damien Hirst. In each case the critics have gathered like clucking hens around the new and inscrutable egg, and the fake is projected to the public with all the apparatus required for its acceptance as the real thing. 
So powerful is the impetus towards the collective fake that it is now rare to be a finalist for the Turner Prize without producing some object or event that shows itself to be art only because the critics have said that it is. Original gestures of the kind introduced by Duchamp cannot really be repeated. Like jokes, they can be made only once. Hence, the cult of originality very quickly leads to repetition. The habit of faking becomes so deeply ingrained that no judgment is certain except the judgment that this before us is the real thing and not a fake at all, which in turn is a fake judgment. All that we know in the end is that anything is art because nothing is. It is worth asking ourselves why the cult of fake originality has such a powerful appeal to our cultural institutions, so that every museum and art gallery and every publicly funded concert hall has to take it seriously. The early modernists, Stravinsky and Schoenberg in music, Eliot and Pound in poetry, Matisse in painting and Loos in architecture, were united in the belief that popular taste had become corrupted that sentimentality, banality and kitsch had invaded the various spheres of art and eclipsed their messages. Tonal harmonies had been corrupted by popular music. Figurative painting had been trumped by photography. Rhyme and metre had become the stuff of Christmas cards and the stories had been too often told. Everything out there in the world of naive and unthinking people was kitsch. Modernism was the attempt to rescue the sincere, the truthful, the arduously achieved from the plague of fake emotion. No one can doubt that the early modernists succeeded in this enterprise, endowing us with works of art that keep the human spirit alive in the new circumstances of modernity, and which establish continuity with the great traditions of our culture. But modernism gave way to routines of fakery. The arduous task of maintaining the tradition proved less attractive than the cheap ways of rejecting it. Instead of Picasso's lifelong study to present the modern woman's face in a modern idiom, you could just do what Duchamp did and paint a moustache on the Mona Lisa. The interesting fact, however, is that the habit of faking it has arisen from the fear of fakes. Modernist art was a reaction against fake emotion and the comforting clichés of popular culture. The intention was to sweep away the pseudo-art that cushions us with sentimental lies and to put reality, the reality of modern life, with which real art alone can come to terms, in the place of it. Hence, for a long time now, it has been assumed that there can be no authentic creation in the sphere of high art which is not in some way a challenge to the complacencies of our public culture. Art must give offence against the bourgeois taste for the conforming and the comfortable, which are simply other names for kitsch and cliché. But the result of this is that offence becomes a cliché. If the public has become so immune to shock that only a dead shark in formaldehyde will awaken a brief spasm of outrage, then the artist must produce a dead shark in formaldehyde. This, at least, is an authentic gesture. There therefore grew around the modernists a class of critics and impresarios who offered to explain just why it is not a waste of your time to stare at a pile of bricks, to sit quietly through ten minutes of excruciating noise, or to study a crucifix pickled in urine. To convince themselves that they are true progressives who ride in the vanguard of history, the new impresarios surround themselves with others of their kind, promoting them to all committees that are relevant to their status and expecting to be promoted in their turn. Thus arose the modernist establishment, the self-contained circle of critics who form the backbone of our cultural institutions and who trade in originality, transgression and breaking new paths. Those are the routine terms issued by the Arts Council bureaucrats and the museum establishment whenever they want to spend public money on something that they would never dream of having in their living room. But these terms are clichés, as are the things they are used to praise. Hence the flight from cliché ends in cliché, and the attempt to be genuine ends in fake. If the reaction against fake emotion leads to fake art, how do we discover the real thing? That is the question I shall explore in my next two talks. In the early years of the 20th century, the arts entered a period of revolution. Enough of the escapism, the modernists said. Art must show modern life as it is. Only in that way can it offer real consolation. 
Ornament is crime, declared the architect Adolf Loos, and all those baroque facades that line the streets of Vienna, encrusted with meaningless knobs and curlicues, are so many denials of the world in which we live. They tell us that beauty belongs in a vanished past. In the face of this message, Loos set out to discover a purer beauty, beauty that belongs to modern life and also endorses it. Loos's contemporary, Arnold Schoenberg, rebelled against the late romantic music of which he was such a master, saying that tonal music had become banal and that writing in the old way led to musical clichés. Schoenberg proceeded to reinvent the language of music, hoping to recover the purity and precision of Mozart or Bach. Eliot and Pound rebelled against the fairy tale poetry of Haussmann and Walter de la Mer. The task of the poet, they insisted, was not to provide nostalgic dreams, but to wake us up to reality. True poetry shows things as they are, and the poet's frame of reference must be rebuilt in order to make this possible. The results will not be easy to understand, but unlike the escapist poetry of the Victorians, it will be worth understanding. In the attacks on the old way of doing things, one word in particular came into currency. That word was kitsch. Once introduced, the word stuck. Whatever you do, it mustn't be kitsch. This became the first precept of the modernist artist in every medium. In a famous essay published in 1939, the American critic Clement Greenberg told his readers that there are only two possibilities available to the artist now. Either you belong to the avant-garde or you produce kitsch. And the fear of kitsch is one reason for the compulsory offensiveness of so much art produced today. It doesn't matter that your work is obscene, shocking, disturbing, as long as it isn't kitsch. Nobody quite knows where the word kitsch came from, though it was current in Germany and Austria at the end of the 19th century. Nobody knows quite how to define the word either. But we all recognise kitsch when we come across it. The Barbie doll, Walt Disney's Bambi, Santa Claus in the supermarket, Bing Crosby singing White Christmas, pictures of poodles with ribbons in their hair. At Christmas we are surrounded by kitsch, worn-out clichés which have lost their innocence without achieving wisdom. Children invest real emotions in Santa Claus. We who are older have only fake emotions to offer. But it feels good to pretend, and when we all join in, it is almost as though we were not pretending at all. The Czech novelist Milan Kundera made a famous observation. Kitsch, he wrote, causes two tears to flow in quick succession. The first tear says, how nice to see children running on the grass. The second tear says, how nice to be moved, together with all mankind, by children running on the grass. Kitsch, in other words, is not about the thing observed, but about the observer. It does not invite you to feel moved by the doll you are dressing so tenderly, but by yourself dressing the doll. All sentimentality is like this. It redirects emotion from the object to the subject, so as to create a fantasy of emotion without the real cost of feeling it. The Kitsch object encourages you to think, look at me feeling this. How nice I am, and how lovable. That is why Oscar Wilde, referring to one of Dickens's most sickly death scenes, said that a man must have a heart of stone not to laugh at the death of little Nell. And that, briefly, is why the modernists had such a horror of kitsch. Art, they believed, had, during the course of the 19th century, lost the ability to distinguish precise and real emotion from its vague and self-satisfied substitute. In figurative painting, in tonal music, in the cliché-ridden poems of heroic love and mythic glory, we find the same disease. The artist is not exploring the human heart, but creating a puffed-up substitute and then putting it on sale. Of course, you can use the old styles, but you cannot seriously mean them. And if you use them nevertheless, the result will be kitsch. Standard, cut-price goods, produced without effort and consumed without thought. Figurative painting becomes the stuff of Christmas cards. Music becomes spineless and sentimental, and literature collapses into cliché. 
Kitsch is fake art, expressing fake emotions, whose purpose is to deceive the consumer into thinking he feels something deep and serious, when in fact he feels nothing at all. However, to avoid kitsch is not so easy as it looks. You could try being outrageously avant-garde, doing something that no one would have thought of doing and calling it art, perhaps trampling on some cherished ideal or religious feeling. But, as I argued last week, this way also leads to fakes. Fake originality, fake significance, and a new kind of cliché, as in so much young British art. You can pose as a modernist, but that won't necessarily lead you to achieve what Eliot, Schoenberg or Matisse achieved, which is to touch the modern heart in its deepest regions. Modernism is difficult. It requires competence in an artistic tradition and the art of departing from tradition in order to say something new. This is one reason for the emergence of a wholly new artistic enterprise, which I call preemptive kitsch. Modernist severity is both difficult and unpopular. So artists began not to shun kitsch, but to embrace it in the manner of Andy Warhol, Alan Jones and Jeff Koons. The worst thing is to be unwittingly guilty of producing kitsch. Far better to produce kitsch deliberately, for then it is not kitsch at all, but a kind of sophisticated parody. Preemptive kitsch sets quotation marks around actual kitsch and hopes thereby to save its artistic credentials. Take a porcelain statue of Michael Jackson cuddling his pet chimpanzee bubbles. Add cheesy colours and a layer of varnish. Set the figures up in the posture of a Madonna and child, endow them with soppy expressions as though challenging the spectator to vomit, and the result is such kitsch that it cannot possibly be kitsch. Jeff Koons must mean something else, we think, something deep and serious that we have missed. Perhaps this work of art is really a comment on kitsch, so that by being explicitly kitsch it becomes meta-kitsch, so to speak. Or take Alan Jones, whose art, currently on display at the Royal Academy, consists of female look-alikes contorted into furniture, dolls with their sexual parts made explicit by underwear, vulgar and childishly nasty visions of the human female, the whole as frothy with fake sentiment as any simpering fashion model. Again, the result is such obvious kitsch that it cannot be kitsch. The artist must be telling us something about ourselves, about our desires and lusts, and forcing us to confront the fact that we like kitsch, while he pours scorn on kitsch by laying it on with a trowel. In place of our imagined ideals in gilded frames, he offers real junk in quotation marks. Preemptive kitsch is the first link in a chain. The artist pretends to take himself seriously, the critics pretend to judge his product, and the modernist establishment pretends to promote it. At the end of all this pretense, someone who cannot perceive the difference between the real thing and the fake decides that he should buy it. Only at this point does the chain of pretense come to an end, and the real value of this kind of art reveals itself, namely its money value. Even at this point, however, the pretense is important. The purchaser must still believe that what he buys is real art, and therefore intrinsically valuable, a bargain at any price. Otherwise, the price would reflect the obvious fact that anybody, even the purchaser, could have faked such a product. The essence of fakes is that they are not really themselves, but substitutes for themselves. Like objects seen in parallel mirrors, they repeat themselves ad infinitum, and at each repetition the price goes up a notch, to the point where a balloon dog by Jeff Koons, which every child could conceive, and some could even manufacture, fetches the highest price ever paid for a work by a living artist, except, of course, that he isn't one. So what, then, is the real thing? How do we tell the real work of art and the fake apart? And why does it matter? This will be the topic of my talk next week. The world of art, I have suggested, is full of fakes. Fake originality, fake emotion, and the fake expertise of the critics, these are all around us, and in such abundance that we hardly know where to look for the real thing. Or perhaps there is no real thing. Perhaps the world of art is just one vast pretense, in which we all take part, since, after all, there is no real cost to it, except to those like Charles Saatchi, rich enough to splash out on junk. Perhaps anything is art if someone says that it is. It's all a matter of taste, they say. 
but is there nothing to be said in reply? Do we have no way of distinguishing true from false art, or saying why art matters and how? I shall make a few positive suggestions. First, however, we must ignore the factors that distort our judgment. Paintings and sculptures can be owned, bought and sold. Hence there is a vast market in them, and whether or not they have a value, they certainly have a price. Oscar Wilde defined the cynic as the one who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. And the art market is inevitably run by cynics. Utter trash accumulates in our museums largely because it has a price tag. You cannot own a symphony or a novel in the way you can own a Damien Hirst. As a result, there are far fewer fake symphonies or fake novels than there are fake works of visual art. Things are distorted, too, by the channels of official patronage. The Arts Council exists to subsidise those artists, writers and musicians whose work is important. But how do bureaucrats decide that something is important? The culture tells them that a work is important if it is original, and the proof that a work is original is that the public doesn't like it. Besides, if the public did like it, why would it need a subsidy? Official patronage therefore inevitably favours works that are arcane, excruciating or meaningless over those that have real and lasting appeal. So what is the source of that appeal and how do we judge that a work of art possesses it? Three words summarise my answer. Beauty, form and redemption. For many artists and critics, beauty is a discredited idea. It denotes the saccharine sylvan scenes and cheesy melodies that appealed to Granny. The modernist message that art must show life as it is suggests to many people that if you aim for beauty, you will end up with kitsch. This is a mistake, however. Kitsch tells you how nice you are. It offers easy feelings on the cheap. Beauty tells you to stop thinking about yourself and to wake up to the world of others. It says, look at this, listen to this, study this, for here is something more important than you. Kitsch is a means to cheap emotion. Beauty is an end in itself. We reach beauty through setting our interests aside and letting the world dawn on us. There are many ways of doing this, but art is undeniably the most important, since it presents us with the image of human life, our own life and all that life means to us, and asks us to look on it directly, not for what we can take from it, but for what we can give to it. Through beauty, art cleans the world of our self-obsession. Our human need for beauty is not something that we could lack and still be fulfilled as people. It is a need arising from our moral nature. We can wander through this world alienated, resentful, full of suspicion and distrust, or we can find our home here, coming to rest in harmony with others and with ourselves. And the experience of beauty guides us along this second path. It tells us that we are at home in the world, that the world is already ordered in our perceptions as a place fit for the lives of beings like us. That is what we see in Corot's landscapes, Cezanne's apples or Van Gogh's unlaced boots. This brings me to my second important word, form. The true work of art is not beautiful in the way an animal, a flower, or a stretch of countryside is beautiful. It is a consciously created thing in which the human need for form triumphs over the randomness of objects. Our lives are fragmented and distracted. Things start up in our feelings without finding their completion. Very little is revealed to us in such a way that its significance can be fully understood. In art, however, we create a realm of the imagination in which each beginning finds its end, and each fragment is part of a meaningful whole. The subject of a Bach fugue seems to develop of its own accord, filling musical space and moving logically towards closure. But it is not an exercise in mathematics. Every theme in Bach is pregnant with emotion, moving with the rhythm of the listener's inner life. Bach is taking you into an imagined space and presenting you in that space with the image of your own fulfilment. 
Likewise, Rembrandt will take the flesh tints on an ageing face and show how each one captures something of the life within, so that the formal harmony of the colours conveys the completeness and unity of the person. In Rembrandt we see integrated character in a disintegrating body, and we are moved to reverence. Formal perfection cannot be achieved without knowledge, discipline and attention to detail. People are slowly beginning to understand this. The illusion that art flows out of us and that the only purpose of an art school is to teach us how to open the taps is no longer believable. Gone are the days when you can make a stir by wrapping a building in polystyrene like Christo, or sitting in silence at a piano for four minutes and thirty-three seconds like John Cage. To be really modern, you must create works of art that take modern life in all its disconnectedness and bring it to fullness and resolution, as Philip Larkin did in his great poem, The Whitson Weddings. It is fine for a composer to lard his pieces with dissonant sounds and cluster chords, like Harrison Birtwistle, but if he knows nothing of harmony and counterpoint, the result will be random noise, not music. It is fine for a painter to splash paint around like Jackson Pollock, but the real knowledge of colour comes through studying the natural world and finding our own emotions mirrored in the secret tints of things, as Cezanne found peace and comfort in a dish of apples. If we look at the true apostles of beauty in our time, I think of composers like Henri Dutilleux and James Macmillan, of painters like David Inshaw and John Wanacott, of poets like Ruth Padel and Charles Tomlinson, of prose writers like Italo Calvino and Georges Perec. We are immediately struck by the immense hard work, the studious isolation and the attention to detail which have characterised their craft. In art, beauty has to be one, and the work is harder as the surrounding idiocy grows. But the task is worth it. And this brings me to my third important word, redemption. In the face of sorrow, imperfection, and the fleetingness of our affections and joys, we ask ourselves why. We need reassurance. We look to art for the proof that life in this world is meaningful and that suffering is not the pointless thing that it so often appears to be, but the necessary part of a larger and redeeming whole. Tragedies show us the triumph of dignity over destruction and compassion over despair. In a way that will always be mysterious, they endow suffering with a formal completion and thereby restore the moral equilibrium. The tragic hero is completed through his fate. His death is a sacrifice, and this sacrifice renews the world. Tragedy reminds us that beauty is a redemptive presence in our lives. It is the face of love, shining in the midst of desolation. We should not be surprised that many of the most beautiful works of modern art have emerged in reaction to hatred and cruelty. The poems of Akhmatova, the writings of Pasternak, the music of Shostakovich. Such works shone a light in the totalitarian darkness and showed love in the midst of destruction. Something similar could be said of Eliot's Four Quartets, of Britain's War Requiem, of Matisse's Chapel at Vence. Modernism arose because artists, writers and musicians held on to the vision of beauty as a redemptive presence in our lives. And that is the difference between the real work of art and the fake. Real art is a work of love. Fake art is a work of deception.